Kevin. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dream Highway podcast, the show that's here to inspire you to go after your dreams and, most importantly, make the most of the journey every step of the way. This is episode 69, and I'm your host, Steve Pedersen. Today, I've got Marcus Ogden as my very special guest. A little background on Marcus. In 2003, he was drafted into the NFL as an offensive lineman, and after five years of playing in the league, he decided to retire and pursue a career in construction and contracting. At the age of 27, he founded a construction company called Caden Premier Enterprises. The company had fast growth and in 2010, but eventually his business went bankrupt, losing almost $2 million on one project in a matter of 90 days. Ouch. During his darkest hours, he pulled himself together, got a part-time job as a custodian with hard work and determination, became an inspirational keynote speaker, executive coach, best-selling author, and marketing leader, helping to build the success of others. Marcus, welcome to the Dream Highway, man. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it, Steve. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, fantastic. It's so great to have you. I definitely appreciate you reaching out and and, and wanting to be on the show and, and just taking some time. I know you're a busy guy, <laughs> so uh, definitely appreciate it. But let's just start out. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're at in the world, you know, what kinds of things you like to do in your spare time, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I currently now live in Raleigh, North Carolina with my wife and two daughters and our two dogs. We are actually going to be closing on our new home on Monday, September 27th. So that's next week. I've been scrambling all morning trying to make sure things get taken care of to the attorney from my realtor and the lender. And it's just always, always that plus trying to do my job, plus try to take care of our dogs. Is it I'm always busy? Yeah. I'm not this busy. Uh, I do enjoy going to the gym. I go to the gym seven days a week. I lift six days a week. I go seven. Uh, <laughs> I truly enjoy uh, the movies. I'm a big movie guy. Uh, I got into that hobby, Steve, when I was in the National Football League as a bigger guy. Uh, and during training camps, it's always hot outside. You're sweating a lot. So during the off days, we cannot, we, we couldn't stay at home. We had to go to whatever, take the day off and come back to for night meetings, whatever. I okay. fell in love with going to the movies because as a bigger guy, I was lazy. I was chubby. Uh, I like movies. I love watching things. And this is because back then, like we didn't really have Netflix or Hulu, okay. things like that. We had, sure. you know, we had cable and DVDs and all that, but movies were a much bigger thing than they are today. Did you have Blockbuster? <laughs> <laughs> ah, you know what? So I was drafted in 03. Blockbuster was still around, but, you know, I think I did a speaking job not that long ago with a gentleman who was uh, um, one of the co-founders of Netflix. And mm. Netflix started coming around, I want to say around like 2005, six ish okay. So there was some Blockbusters, but, you know, for me, I wasn't much into the movie rental stuff because I could just go buy the DVDs and stuff like that. Sure. But I love going to the movies and, you know, that hobby has stuck with me ever since, you know, the NFL. So that's probably yeah. my prime that. And I also like to play poker. I enjoy that to oh, you know, relax and have fun and things like that. Yeah. And did so during the pandemic, what did you do for movies then? Just Great Netflix? <laughs> so it was just Netflix. I mean, yeah. so Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. I mean, that first few months, Steve, was really hard. Like, yeah. And everything was closed. Restaurants were, I ever, I'll never forget, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. The, when the pandemic was still, there was, I mean, still going today, but it was really, really heavy. But um, Longhorn opened mm. up there uh, for business. Sure. My wife and I had never been somewhere where the food tasted so good. The <laughs> service was amazing. I'm like, yes. I yeah. Now, go to a restaurant and then i'll never forget when our, our dine-in movie theater opened up back again that was huge because my wife loves like you know having a little vodka tonic with her you know for dinner uh, with something i love like popcorn and all that and she likes the fact they have like those reclined seats mm -hmm. yeah so that's kind of her big thing and so she loves that now what's interesting you said the sort of the dine-in movie experience i 
I'm up in Chicago and I don't know if I've ever seen one of those up here and I'm from Minnesota, but when I went down to visit uh, my aunt and uncle down in, uh, I think, Gulfport, Mississippi, they had one down there. Is this kind of a thing in the South or in Southeast or? Great question. It's, it's really big in the South. So like, uh, but they're starting to try to take a little bit Northeast. So the one place I was at is called Cinebistro. They've got, mm-hmm. Uh, they've got movie theaters in North Carolina. They got one here in Raleigh, one in Charlotte, one in Atlanta. There's one in uh, a couple parts of Florida, a couple in Florida. There is the one in um, in Maryland, uh, in Baltimore. They did this build one in Baltimore, which you know it wasn't there when I was there in Baltimore, but they do have one in Baltimore now. So it's kind of kind of like you know going like, I started to say start in the Southeast and then kind of went going a little bit Southwest. Now we're kind of going a little bit more up Northeast. Okay. And uh, there are some, I guess to be driving movie theaters like more out West, but not really like the dinner type sure. of atmosphere uh, right. in the Southeast. Yeah, well, right. With drive-in, of course you bring your own dinner. <laughs> so it's like a picnic. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Well, thanks for sharing all that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your dreams. Uh, you played in the NFL. Did did you have a dream as that for as a kid? Did you always dream like I'm going to be a football player someday? No, absolutely not. Uh, because when I left high school, I was six foot three, and then when I got to college as a freshman, uh, incoming freshman, I was almost six foot six. So I grew about two and a half, three inches uh, between my last year, between maybe that summer before my first year at Howard. So for me, and I was a kid that was a good player, but I was really underdeveloped and undercoached, uh, unfortunately. Some of my, uh, my high school coaches were good people, great guys and great people as far as wanting to help kids succeed. Sure. But the coaching was not of a high level. My brother started playing football in the seventh grade and he got great coaching from seventh grade through 12th grade. Mm. And my brother had every division one school make him an offer. Mm. I had zero until Howard at the last minute, which was one double A, made an offer for me to go to college, which I was so excited about, Steve, because my father was a, a Howard alum as well. Mm. Got it. Well, a great plug for coaching, <laughs> right? Yeah, man, proof is in the pudding. So, uh, you know, one question I have is, as an NFL player, obviously during the season, you're out there, you're playing, uh, the rest of America is sitting back and, you know, relaxing, watching the game. Uh, what do you, what would you as an NFL player do? Like, would you watch the other games just for entertainment and enjoyment? If so, when would you do that? So during the season, so when I was a player, correct, Steve? Mm-hmm. I would yeah. watch the games for enjoyment at like bars or outing with, with different friends and things like that. But then I really would watch games also at sometimes we're going to play a certain team that they were on to do film study, to get to see tendencies and what players would do and, you know, all that kind of stuff as well. So I spent a lot of time learning the game, uh, not learning the game learning my potential opponents, what they like to do, mm. their tendencies, things like that. I was always a student of the game, which got me when I got to Howard, and I was like, maybe if I start for a year or two, you know, that'll be awesome. Get a great, get a free education. Cause now back at this time, Steve, you know, again, a lot of this TV was different. So you had like mm. a lot of sitcoms, like different world, the Cosby show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, mm. they were, Martin, they were always promoting Howard, Howard, Howard. So mm. me at Howard at that time was phenomenal. Yeah. So I was like, if, I, if I'm a two-year starter, you know, whatever, that, and get a little playing time, get a free education, awesome. Well, Howard had different plans for me. So I started as a freshman, a redshirt freshman. I was a four-year starter at Howard. Mm. But what got me to be, go from being a good player to a great player at Howard was film study and I changed the way I approached the game to get more seriously and that's why I'm still today Steve the only offensive lineman ever drafted from Howard University to the NFL mm. the four guys have gone into the NFL to play at Howard which I'm in and there's been I think about maybe about 13 or 14 players drafted in our history overall a lot of running backs a couple of tight ends D linemen a couple of quarterbacks 
but I'm the only O lineman, Steve, to be drafted mm-hmm. from Howard University to the National Football League. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we've got coaching and being a student of the game. Those are those are a couple of great points we're getting out of this so far, Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Now, let me ask you this. So a couple of things actually are coming to my mind. One is obviously I'm a musician, got all the guitars here. So I'm on a different level when it comes to listening to music or going to a concert. You know, if it's was did you find watching football and even watching it with other people like you're clearly on a different level. Uh, did you find it frustrating maybe to be with, talk with other people about it? You know what I'm saying? Kind of like a musician would. Oh, great question. So if somebody was watching it, trying to enjoy the game and having back and forth banter, no problem. Mm-hmm. If somebody's trying to watch it, trying to dissimulate and, you know, really make some type of real, you know, progression or real type of, informational viewpoint about the game and you don't know the game then i was going to step and say hey i know what you're trying to say but this might work better this might work better and but i found myself trying not to do that very much because very few people were were going to combat me when it comes to breaking down games and things like that because i knew one of the biggest pluses for me on my scouting reports coming out of college was I was just such a student of the game and I really worked hard and I took some raw talent that I had and I developed it into a much larger talent to play the game. And so Mm -hmm. very few times people ever combat me when it comes to breaking down things. Now, of course, if I just combat me as a a current player or a former player or a coach, then of course they have the credentials to do so. Like today for me as a speaker, if I heard from Les Brown about how to do something better, I'm going to like, yep, it's time to shut up and listen. Yep. Right? That's somebody that has the knowledge and expertise in my field that I can say, yes, they should be, what they say can make a huge difference. Yeah. But don't have to tell me how to do something or what to do if you have no experience in that, in that uh, arena to begin with. Yeah, which is maybe why people start podcasts, right? So you've got the... Uh, was it the Lev and Mark Marcus show? Correct. All right. So there's kind of the, like your opportunity to uh, talk a little bit more shop, you know, as it were. Right. So, so a great question, Steve. And so the Lev and Marcus show is really designed to have amazing people with amazing stories share with our audience. Got it. And it also helps for me as a speaker, coach, consultant, I'm also a best selling author. And I own parts of different businesses, Steve, that align with our brand. Mm-hmm. It's another way of getting out content, premium content, but at the same time, not always talking over someone, trying to basically, you know, uh, ramrod someone. It's about how to let somebody else tell their story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, Oprah, love Oprah. I mean, I was probably seven or eight years old one day. Uh, uh, so I was probably about six or seven when, oh, when my dad was working in downtown DC, right by the White House. And I was walking in a jewelry store because they knew me because my dad worked in the building. My dad was a really big guy. He stood out. And of course, there weren't a lot of African-Americans working in that building back in, in the in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. So they knew who we were. So I was walking around this kind of just looking at stuff, being a kid. And they, they, of course, my dad knew where I was. And um, they told him you know where I was at. So he knew everything was fine. And I remember they locked all the doors to the, uh, you know, to the uh, jewelry shop. That was kind of like, I said, well, what's going on? I said, Marcus, everything's fine. As we have a very high profile person coming in to the store. I said, mm. okay. And I look to my right and I look up and it's Oprah Winfrey. Mm. And so, and oh, I was just literally like, wow. Like I just kind of <laughs> like, I'm, I'm six or seven. I'm kind of like, Oh my God. And I like, oh, and so of course, because I was so young and all that, and the owner knew me and let me stay in the store while she was looking around at what she wanted to buy. And I'll never forget that. And you talk about something or someone or somebody has built a brand off of not ramrodding people, mm-hmm. off of interviewing people. Like yeah. Oprah Winfrey has made, it's become a billionaire yeah. off of interviewing people, you know, and she's, yeah by the odds and she's become a champion for so many 
But yeah. that's, her, that's, I mean, that's how her whole brand got. The Oprah Winfrey show was designed to interview people with amazing stories and get out their information, mm -hmm. their, their perspective to audiences. Yeah, right. And that, uh, that sounds like what you're doing. That's what I'm trying to do here with the Dream Highway yeah. is inspire people that might be, you know, kind of struggling. Like, hey, here's, you know, uh, people know people, right? Like Oprah, you say Oprah, everybody knows Oprah. Uh, not everybody's going to know me. Not everybody's going to know you. And that's why we have these platforms to get those, uh, even though, hey, you know, might not be a household name, your story is incredibly important uh, to get out there. Um, one question I have is, so you said you played for the NFL for five years and then decided to retire. What, um, can you talk a little bit about why that was? Were you feeling some kind of incongruency? Were you starting to have other thoughts about what you wanted to do with your life? What was sort of the impetus of that? Good question. So my father passed away of a rare heart condition in 2006. I came back in 2007 and I started playing and things got really difficult for me because my body had gone through a lot of different things. And that season when my father passed away, it was just a huge arduous and very just negative impactful blow mm -hmm. and because of that steve i said man i can't do this at a high level anymore and my body started breaking down and i had some really bad back issues and then i said hey i told my agent i go i just can't do this much anymore so they released me gave me a settlement and that was it for me and then mm -hmm. i got better once my mental state got better uh regards to my dad and what happened and then i i, I knew the nfl wasn't going to be anymore because it was just you know that's just the best of the best and i was good at what i did and i was mm -hmm. very good at being a, uh, a competitor but i wasn't the best of the best anymore when i mm -hmm. left the game in 0708 so what i did was i started playing some indoor football other things like that just for competition trying to keep myself active and uh, that was a great thing for me because it allowed me to speak to, to compete and just to get myself out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and not, you know, and this, it, the camaraderie of playing with some good guys, I still talk to this day, some good coaches I still talk to this day. And uh, yeah, so I made the decision just to move on from the NFL and yeah. needed to find a new phase of life. Yeah. And that is, that is a tough trend. That is a tough life transition. I lost my dad about uh, 12 years ago and you know, whether you were close with your dad or not, you know, that kind of a finality definitely brings about some change in your life for sure. Kind of makes you sit down and think a little bit. So yeah. especially yeah. when our father raised us by himself between mm. not by, my, my brother was 14 and I was uh, eight when our mom left us and our dad ended up raising us uh, as a single parent for the rest of our, you know, my brother 14 till he went to college and me from eight till I went to college as well. And thank God for my maternal grandparents, my mom's parents who mm. sided, who sided with my dad mm. when he left because yeah. they wanted to be, they wanted to be close to us. And those two individuals gave me so much hope and so much, there's a great quote by Aristotle, in times of extreme darkness, focus on the light. And that's exactly what my grandparents did for me. They mm. gave me a light to focus on in some really dark times between the divorce and my mom, who wasn't really the best mom, uh, to you know struggles with you know uh, my size, my weight, to you know being a little bit awkward, you know, growing up uh, not a popular kid, and so all these moving parts. My grandparents were that light for me, so it was mm. huge uh, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, that that does sound huge, and then. What that makes me wonder is, you, you know, I read earlier about some of the unfortunate things that happened in your business, how and how you were able to turn that around. How much do you think that your maternal grandparents sort of informed or formed maybe even some things in you that enabled you to get through that time? Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. My grandmother had a saying, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Mm. And my grandmother was my shining star. She was, you know, my life. Uh, you know, I was close. I mean, I don't get. I was close to my grandfather too, without a doubt. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. My grandmother, I just had a special bond and, you know, all the things that, you know, she helped me through and helped me to become a better person overall. And what she did for me, Steve, was she instilled in me what I call that, that never ending determination to be who I am today. And without her and without her sacrifices and my grandpa's sacrifices and my dad's sacrifices, there's no way I could bounce back because when I lost everything as a result of my ego and some bad decisions, and I also started to treat people as objects and not very valuable human capital, it all compiled on top of me mm-hmm. and that thing started to go in a really bad place. Can you talk a little bit, you mentioned ego. Um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe the specifics of what that looked like? Sure. So I have an I have an acronym for ego, mm. exaggerated glorified opinions. Mm. <laughs> when I had my business, Steve, I was always constantly near the end and at the end, even exaggerating how good I was. Mm. And that was a result of fear and insecurity and people constantly praising me. And I really didn't know anything about construction at all, Steve. Mm. Nothing. But I got lucky. So instead of trying to learn and how to become a better leader and serve my people better, I said, eh, I'll just be greedy and I'll just take all this money and I'll have an ego and I'll exaggerate how good I am to people. Hmm. When questions me, I'm a big guy. I'm almost six, I'm almost six, I'm six, five and a half, six, six. I was probably about three thirty at that time. Like I'll just yell, I'll get kind of like, you know, abrasive. I'll get hmm. very rageful or very jealous or very, you know, I'll, I'll just talk with a, a sense of wrath and that'll get people to leave me alone. And mm. it worked. But un- unfortunately, as I was exaggerating how good I was, I was deteriorating and I was, I was defiling. And, and that's a strong word, but it's a good word. I was defiling the relationships that I had with my team. Mm. And I was ruining the, the relationships I had with my client base. Mm. And that along with a really bad job that I did in 2012. And then my, my best employees leaving me out, you know, you know, over time. And it only took me, once things started to go bad in that job, Steve, it only took me 90 days to lose everything. Mm. That's when I lost everything. And as a result of that, I had to start all over again. And it was a really long ride. So that's exaggerated. G glorified. I always wanted to be the best of the best. I wanted the attention on me. If we did something great, I wanted all the attention. If something yeah. was bad, go, it was my employee's fault. So I was always chasing glory, fame, notoriety, what I call external motivating factors that have no bearing on how good you are, what you mm. do. And I was just chasing those things. And again, it caught up with me. And then opinions. People would say, Marcus, do this, do that, do that. It'll be better for the company. I'd say, well, that <laughs> sounds good, but, but I would always have a but. Yeah. I always want that last word. Mm-hmm. I had to always make my opinion known. So as a result of that, you know, my ego literally was the biggest silent killer mm. of our business. Mm. Wow, that's that's very powerful. What I, makes me think of, I have actually have a song called You Are the Difference. And, and the whole story and message behind the song is that it's not so much what's being done through you, it's what's being done within you that's important. And instead of trying to find our validation ex- from external things to find uh, our validation within and then do great things because we feel so great about ourselves and that validation... Um, did you, I'm not sure if this is fair or not, but did you kind of look, have thoughts like, don't you know who I am? Sure. Of yeah. course. Of yeah. course I did. Yeah. Which is why my ego went through the roof. I'm like, don't you know who I am? I'm a former Raven. I'm John Noggin's brother. I've got this massive company. Who cares if I don't know what I'm doing? Who cares if I can't pay my, if I can't pay my vendors? Who cares if I'm late on my payroll? Who cares, who cares, who cares? I always found an excuse or a reason to say to those words, well, don't you know who I am? Or why should I care about that? Mm. So, no, that's a, that's a very fair statement. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no holding punches here. 
There's no <laughs> holding back in this episode. That's how I thought. Yeah. And that's exactly why, Steve, I got what I deserve. Hmm. A broken, bankrupted business that was led and spearheaded by an egomaniac boss, not a cognitive, non-emotional leader. Hmm. And so this happens, this thing happens in your life. What's what's kind of the first thing that goes through your mind? Do you freak out and like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like, do you try to save face or was the response like, so you say, maybe I need to humble out here. Like no, no, after the bankruptcy. Yeah. No. So I moved down to Raleigh in 2013. I got here. Home was foreclosed on both cars repossessed in the same day. Mm. Lost all of my money. I had $400 in the bank account mm. and we, bills were due in two weeks. And I was basically a week to two weeks away from being homeless. And some things turned around for me. We got some great opportunity from what's called the Gene Upshaw Trust Fund. It's a program designed by the NFLPA and the Player Care Foundation to help players who can prove financial hardship. And that gave me sovereigns for four months. But okay. I still did not put myself in a position for what I call to be humble and for that time between April 2013 and September 2013, I was still in victim mode. I was fired from that Merrill Lynch job I had. And I went to another job the next day. I was fired from that job for a construction company five days later. And they took back the car they gave me, the phone they gave me, the, the laptop they gave me. And I was back to square one. And I still had that, don't you know who I am? Don't you know who I am mentality? But what happened is I had my spoiled milk, rock bottom moment of clarity where somebody's trash and rotten meat and nasty banana peels got over my body, my skin, and my clothes. And that was my wake up call, Steve. And from that moment on, it was no more victim mode. It was no more poor Marcus. It was no more. Marcus, you are, you know, everybody should feel sorry for you. They should know who you are. And I really took to heart what my grandfather used to always tell me. I said, hey, Granddad, how you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good, Marcus. If I wasn't doing good, who would care anyway? Mm. So Granddad, I would care. He said, well, yeah, you would care, but mm. nobody else would care. And he always just tell me, people have their own problems. They don't care about yours. And he was right. And mm. so I was always, I was sitting basically between April 2013, Steve, and September 2013. I was waiting for someone to come and save me. Mm. Another company gave me this, this phenomenal job making 100000 a year. I was waiting for the bankruptcy attorney to say, Marcus, don't worry about paying us you know, the rest of the money to file your bankruptcy. We'll take care of that for you. Mm. It took me six months, Steve, to pay a $3,300 bankruptcy invoice hmm. to file a chapter seven bankruptcy when i had 177 creditors on my docket and over five and a half million dollars of debt hmm. and i couldn't even get it filed in uh, uh, quick enough now thank goodness none of the companies came after me mm -hmm. but i couldn't even file it steve to protect myself couldn't get it filed it took six months. Mm. I had to pay $400 here, $300 there, $400 here, because I was basically, I was, when I got fired from both those jobs, I was working as coaching uh, football. I was coaching football to the youth. Mm -hmm. I also took a job as a custodian. And that for that time period, again, April 2013 to September 2013, I was waiting for somebody to come and sweep me up and say, Marcus, I feel sorry for you. Mm. Hand you this job for a hundred thousand mm. dollars. Let me hand you this. Let me hand you that. And nobody was gonna hand me anything. And I realized that. And once I realized that after that spoiled milk moment, that's when my life got better. Yeah. I started focusing on doing things I needed to get done and focusing on, you know, turning my life around and all these different things. So that was, you know, that's how it happened at that time. That that was the moment that you needed to take ownership of your life. Yeah, that that's huge. I mean, 
I, and I think what's so tricky about that is that we hear that all the time and we nod our heads and we say, yeah, that's, that's great. And maybe we even think we're doing that, but it takes things like this happening. And I, I'm curious when that, that custodian moment happened and I can, I can just envision it. I, I almost, <laughs> I almost compare it to like the, the story of Jonah, you know, where he's inside you know, the belly of the fish or what is getting that seaweed wrapped around his head. I'm like, it's got to be super disgusting. And that's kind of like what I'm thinking. Right. Um, and that, and, you know, Jonah had kind of a wake up moment. Was there a specific thought that you had that was kind of like click that made sense? So when I, after I put my head in my hand and cried for about 10 minutes on the curb, the first thing I did was I got up, I said, moment of cl that click was, you need to go home, write down your three biggest strengths that you possess, mm. and build from there. Mm. And once I did that, I said, I want to be, I'm good at communication. I am good at stories and I want to help people, specifically retired NFL athletes. That's when I said, I listen to this guy named Tony Robbins a lot on podcasts. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he's popping up on you know, mindset and perseverance and grit. So I, would, I would listen to him uh, while I was doing my shifts. So I said, hmm, let me be, go ahead and become a speaker. That sounds sensational. Mm. That's what I did. But I want your audience to know this too. When I started the business September 2013, I didn't get a paid job until April of 2016. Mm. Two and a half years, no paid job. I work other main jobs as a football coach, a birthday party, at, a birthday clown at parties, mm. I ran a seven on seven league. I was a, uh, I was a runner for a construction company, running equipment and tools and supplies out to job sites, getting up at 5 a.m. to do that. I worked and it was called a track out camp, which is like a basic a summer camp. But down here in North Carolina, where we live, we have what's called a track out system. You're in school for nine weeks, out for three. No summer break, in nine, out three, in mm. nine, out three. And they call that a year-round school. Okay. So I would work in, they would have different tracks, track one, two, three, and four. So I worked at what's called, I'm sure you probably know this, it was this area, Steve, Lifetime Gym there for Minnesota. Sure. Lifetime Gym here in my area during track out camps. And that's what I did, man. And I just did all these different main jobs while I pursued my side hustle, which was mm. speaking. Mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted everybody to know and I got my first paid job April 2016 and then Steve I got some really great feedback through, throughout the process 2018 I got coached to uh, went through a big coaching program at Penn State met a mentor of mine her name is Mel Robbins and I learned the business and so in the last five years I've now worked for 26 fortune Founder companies as a speaker. Uh, of the 26, I think 12 or 13 are Fortune 100, a couple of Fortune 50, even Fortune 25. I've done work for all types of industries to, you know, uh, staffing, education, food, technology. I've done consulting. I've done one on one coaching, group mm -hmm. coaching. You know, I have now our podcast that we do. And so I'm very specific in how I put my time out. But I also love the marketing aspect of the business. And that's why I tell people, if you're not willing to get on podcasts, which is probably one of the, if not the primary way to do marketing these days, other than, of course, television, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it's better than, uh, I think it's better. Well, main time television is better. But if you're doing small time television, I think, I think podcasts are better. Yeah. It's one of the best forms of marketing, I feel. Yeah, so yeah. Not get out there and try to put yourself in front of people, then by God, don't even bother starting your business. Well, and it's making me think uh, of this line from the song, you got to pay your dues if you want to play the blues and you know it don't come easy. And I think there is definitely, you know, people see that tip of the iceberg and, ooh, I want that. You listen to Tony Robbins. Ah, that sounds easy. <laughs> I could be a motivational speaker. Man, I've been doing this now. It's, it's eight years this month. I started September 2013. It's been eight years this month. And it's been five and a half years since I got my first paid job. Mm. And that, that, that first two and a half told no every single time. Mm. 
Yeah. Looking back on it, though, I focused on wanting to tell my story with no con uh, with no continuity, with no congruence, with no real, you know, thought process, no real, you know, no real vantage point or advantage to the audience. Mm. I said, I'm going to go up there and be a speaker. I was going to speak. And so that's what I did. And today through coaching and speaking and working on my craft and just again when i'm on podcasts you know the way i talk the way i you know the mannerisms like that's part of being a speaker yeah on podcast talking like uh uh like, like what kind of speaker is this guy like yeah i want to work with this guy so it's a you know life is always a constant promotion mm. The podcast with the guy who used to be business partners with Jim Rohn. And he said that Jim Rohn was most successful in his life between the age of 59 and 79. Interesting. And 99% of why Jim Rohn went from, this is back in the mid 90s, $10,000 an hour, right, for a speech, doing about 11 a year to $40,000 an hour. And went from a, doing 11 speeches a year to like 125 a year was marketing. Mm. 99% of successful people, especially speakers, musicians, you know, it's about your marketing. Yeah, totally. And, and that's so tough because most of us, we, we love what we do. We don't necessarily love marketing. <laughs> if you don't, but I, tell, I tell my clients this all the time. If nobody knows you exist, they can never buy your product. That's true. That's so true. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, as a movie, uh, avid movie buff, do you remember the movie A Beautiful Mind? Of course. Yeah. I, uh, uh, Kevin Spacey. And I think it was that movie where uh, the guy had uh, visions, like he would see people, right? Kevin and. Spacey, yeah. And, and eventually he got to realize, oh, this is kind of all in my mind, but they were still there. Even though he could tell that it was a figment of his imagination, he could tell that they were still there. What I'm curious about is, you know, the things that are in our past, we can have sort of victory, if you will, over those things but they they're kind of like those phantoms in that movie where they don't always just completely go away and i'm curious if that's something that sense of don't you know who i am does that still kind of come back uh from time to time or have you maybe figured out a way to successfully and quickly identify those thoughts and silence them what what's those, been your thought though great question but those thoughts are no longer phantoms they're dead to me mm -hmm. because i know what's lying on the other side of that phantom ego mm -hmm. what cost me my business in my construction company was my ego so because of that failure not just a small bump in the road failure but a major catastrophic wow what has happened to my life failure no home no cars no money no, a zero credit. Yeah. I had to start all over from a zero credit. Everything taken from me in a matter of just months. With that type of really demonstrative fallout, if you don't learn, you're in a really bad spot. Yeah. 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 Trying to be become a public figure is probably not the wisest move. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, unless you love failing in front of, you know, publicly in front of people. Uh, let me ask you this. What's one of the favorite things the, about what you're doing now? What do you love most about what you're doing now? I love to get, I love when I can see the light turn on people, either facial expressions or any other type of ways that they can get what they want in life with something I've told them, either mm. people through speaking, coaching, consulting, books, Facebook lives, you know, anything of that nature that they actually can see, okay, if I do it this way, I could have success that way. So for me, that's really one of the things I love most about what I do. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful. That's, it's so empowering. And, and I think you alluded to it earlier when 
when you got started speaking, it's not just that, hey, I'm out here, look at what an eloquent, awesome, amazing, powerful, charismatic speaker I am. It's, hey, how can I support you on what it is that you're trying to do? I think uh, on your uh, LinkedIn profile, it says, uh, I had written it down. Uh, I began speaking to help others succeed where I failed. Yeah. Right. Love right. it. Love it. So what kind of words of wisdom would you have for somebody who's, they're thinking, man, my dream is too big. Uh, I, I could never, it's a pipe dream. I should just get real. <laughs> you know. So I'll tell everybody, just I'll end with this. Use the SMART goal process. Be specific in what you want to do. Measure what you're doing. Attainably set the goals. Don't set things too big, too unrealistic. Set the baby goals to get you to that end goal. Are relevant things towards that goal. And T, put a time-bound stamp on those goals. So using the SMART goal, Acronym will be huge, mm. but be an active listener. The best business leaders are active listeners that can take information, they can listen, they can process, they can analyze, they can create what I call eight, an, antici an anticipation, uh, prepared, executable strategy to get from where you are to where you want to be. Mm. So that's huge in that regard. So again, be sure that you can you use that strategy, but also use smart goals to help you build towards your tomorrow ending. Love it. Love it. Great stuff. Ah, Marcus, thank you so much. First of all, for again, just taking time to be on the show. This has been just a great, uh, I've just loved this conversation, getting to know you better. Uh, thank you so much for all of your, you know, just sharing your heart, your wisdom, your experience, all of this is there, a, uh, where's the best place for people to go to find out more about you and about what you offer? Sure, they can go to our website, www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. Go there, check us out, get in touch with us today. We'd love to hear from you, have a nice casual conversation. Yeah, love it, love it, perfect. Well, I'll make sure I put that in the show notes. Uh, so in case somebody's driving right now, please don't try to write that down. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, we'll get the show notes. The show notes will be at thedreamhighway.com slash 69, today's uh, 69th episode. For now, I'm going to say thank you for joining us on the Dream Highway podcast. Uh, don't forget to follow uh, the podcast to continue to get inspiration to keep you on the journey to your dreams. So long for now. We'll catch you next time on the Dream Highway.